Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to uh, participate in this conference. Um, just my talk today is about migration in sort of the broadest sense. And in fact, uh, my, my real agenda here is to talk about bird movements in general. Migration is a very familiar and stereotyped type of bird movement. Um, other kinds of bird movements are dispersal and vagrancy. And these three things are things I've studied for uh, actually most of my life in one way or another. And I think that they, um, they offer insights into each other. And uh, my point uh, today is going to be to describe a little bit about the diversity of our avifauna here on Long Island, but also to talk about how the efforts of amateur naturalists can give us really unique kinds of information and insights into the uh, composition of our avifauna. And I'm going to begin um, by talking about the, the traditional way of looking at uh, biological diversity and its conservation. I assume that almost everybody here at this conference would consider themselves to be a conservationist interested in protecting biodiversity. And these three truisms are that um, we need good, accurate data about what organisms occur where in order to plan for their conservation and protection. Um, another idea that you'll find uh, pretty prevalent is that for birds, uh, relative to other taxa, that our knowledge is relatively complete. So we don't f discover brand new species of birds very often, or vertebrates for that matter, though Jeremy is going to uh, tell us that there are exceptions to that as well. And it's actually a good connection to this uh, citizen science angle. Um, and finally, that you know, Long Island has been studied by talented naturalists for many, many, uh, for, for centuries, actually. So that if there were one place in the United States besides Concord, Massachusetts, that uh, can claim to have its uh, uh, biodiversity absolutely pinned down, you'd think that it was, uh, it was Long Island. All these things are true, but in a qualified sense. And I would like to say that they should not be accepted uncritically. And in particular, they shouldn't be used as excuses to not do things that we have reason to know, we should know better that we would like to do for other reasons. Um, deficiencies in data are sometimes used as excuses not to do something that we have reason to believe we ought to do. And finally, uh, well, secondly, avian distribution is not as well known as, uh, as people might think. And finally, even in our own backyard, there are systematic gaps, not just random imperfections, but there are actually systematic weaknesses in our knowledge of what species occur, even right here in the New York metro area. So my scheme for going through this is to look at migration, movements of birds through our corner of the world, taking a seasonal approach. I'm going to start out with fall, osprey migrating along the, the, uh, the beach, uh, feeding as it goes, then winter, snowy owl, Spring, Blackburnian warbler, bird that neither breeds nor winters on Long Island, but which passes through in, in migration. And then summer, not typically a time when we think of migration, but birds are migrating vast distances to visit us. In this case, Wilson storm petrels that breed in the Antarctic and come and visit us during our summer. So this is a photograph of the way Fire Island used to look from the lighthouse. Uh, but even the way it looks now, it's still absolutely the crossroads of migration. It is a place where you can go, and I say this in a serious way, I expect to see, with very few exceptions, eventually every single species of North American bird and some non-North American birds if I go birding there enough over, over my lifetime. It is a place that if birds get up and start moving, they will wind up there. So beginning with the fall, um, our geography really does favor encountering birds as they move around. It's a palm warbler. When birds are migrating south during the fall, they uh, often do this after high pressure builds up after a cold front. Northwesterly winds are the prevailing winds under those conditions. They like that northerly component of the wind, but because the coastline takes a turn here, the westerly component of the wind actually forces them out towards the open water. They don't like to do that, so they track along the barrier beach until they make it back to the continent, concentrating sometimes just phenomenal numbers and diversity of, of, uh, of species. Tree swallows are a common fall migrant. Ospreys, as I mentioned before. Ospreys are a, a little bit of uh, 
a special conservation story here because this is a bird that we figured out not without difficulty what was harming them and we fixed it and that's a case of, of you know a real success story for conventional wildlife biology in conservation. Fall migration though has lots of mysteries to it. Does anybody know what this bird is? It's actually not a totally familiar bird to most New Yorkers. It's a, it's a stilt sandpiper. Stilt sandpipers migrate through the middle of the, the continent in, in large numbers, but in New York State, the best place to find them is near the coast, but not on salt water, on freshwater, grassy uh, wetlands near the immediate coast, a bizarre combination of, of, uh, of features that if you didn't really study it and know where to look, you could go birding for decades and decades and not get to know this bird. Another bird that migrates in the fall mainly through the center of the continent, but every year a few individuals show up along, along our, uh, our coast. Again, not usually on the outermost coast, but in grassy habitats, it's a buff-breasted sandpiper. Almost all the, the, the buff-breasted sandpipers we get here on Long Island have one thing in common, which is a little bit unusual. They're almost all juveniles. The adults don't bother wandering out this far. And sometimes there are surprises. There are birds that uh, fly under the radar and change their status a little bit. Um, this is a yellow-throated warbler. It's uh, still an uncommon to rare species, but it has become um, more regular in recent years. And the close attention that uh, um, avid bird watchers pay to rare species has told us almost everything we know about the increasing status of this species in our region. It's not picked up in, in uh, conventional wildlife monitoring effort. And there are other kinds of bird data that are very difficult to detect by traditional methods of applying constant effort or systematic effort. These are pine siskins. They're making one of their largest incursions into, this is a, a small finch that breeds up in the northern woodlands and occasionally erupts to the south for combinations of food scarcity, local abundance, local um, resource scarcity, they, they move out. And this year, on one day, the 21st of October, out at Fire Island, we counted these guys and we came up with over 20,000 pine siskins flying by um, the western end of, of Fire Island. Now, any wildlife manager who is trying to come up with a conservation plan for pine siskin, they would look at, you know, conifer um, habitats in the north. They might look at places where they wind up in, in the suburban mid-Atlantic during in, invasions. But these birds were only there for a few hours of one day. And there are other birds that pass through on other days uh, during the fall. But this concentration of individuals is biologically significant and it's the kind of information that amateur naturalists are in some ways the only people who are in a position to, uh, to detect and to put into a framework of past knowledge. So for instance, if somebody were to do a um, environmental impact study prior to a wind turbine proposal, they might go out and sample on a series of days for what sorts of birds might in, be impacted by such a proposal. They wouldn't encounter that day. That day has only happened once you know, in, my, in my life. The, the chances of them encountering it would be very, very low. Indeed, it is a, it's, it's a rare event, but it's still a biologically significant event, and it could be you know, significant for the entire population if these 20,000 birds got subtracted out on a, on a, a rare event. Moving on to, to winter, one of the uh, really amazing biological phenomena that we see here on Long Island are our, our wintering sea ducks, like these black scoters. And if you go all around the island, every single bit of the coastline is home to, to uh, sea ducks of various kinds. These are surf scoters off of Montauk. Um, but you really get a sense of, of the, the scale of, of uh, Long Island's natural resources in, in playing a role in, in the lives of these birds. And yet they're highly variable from year to year, and there are trends over decades of which species have become more abundant, less abundant. Back in the old days, in the, in the 40s, king eiders used to occur in flocks of up to 15 off of Montauk and were decidedly the most frequent scoter, ever, I mean, freak, uh, the, the most numerous eider. Um, everywhere on Long Island. Common eider was a rare bird on Long Island for many, many years. Absolutely the reverse today, for reasons that we largely don't understand. 
And other things we don't understand, why there are white wing crossbills this year, but you can go 15 years at a time without seeing them. Flocks of them all over the place this year. Some birds are pretty reliable. These are, are snow buntings, which are common on our outer beaches. They're Arctic uh, uh, breeders, and they, they, uh, they use our, our, uh, our beaches during the winter. Sometimes tracked down here by snowy owls. And the theme here is that our little corner of the world is a place where birds from all corners of the world actually do wind up coming together. This is a dovekey, an Arctic uh, breeding seabird, that actually occurs in the tens of thousands offshore from Long Island during the winter. Difficult to detect this, but they are out there, and people have known that they're out there. Occasionally, we have storms that drive them in, and we ha this bird was probably seen by many people in this room as it dunked around in a um, boat basin over at Timber Point a couple of winters ago. Um, but it, they're, rest assured, there are thousands and thousands of them out there almost every winter. But nevertheless, there still are really big gaps in our knowledge. This is a common myrrh. And this is what was known of the occurrence of common myrrh, not on, on Long Island, but in, in Rhode Island. The story on Long Island is almost um, exactly the same. In a century of field work there, there were just this handful of records. If you look at these localities, all of these are coastal localities except for this one offshore. Just a handful of oiled individual common myrrhs that had come to grief and come, come ashore. That's the only way it was known to have occurred in Rhode Island. And yet, part of this was surely a detection problem. Part of it is probably biological, part of it is detection, because they're difficult to identify, it's difficult to get out to their actual um, pelagic zone of preference. So these are the records of people, including myself, well, these are my own records, who made a determined effort to go out and find and identify and document these birds just in a 10-year span. And we have now proven very, very um, conclusively that these are a regular, a natural part of our avifauna, both on Long Island and uh, Rhode Island offshore. But this was really proven by amateur birders. Another gap in our understanding of which birds occur where can come from other kinds of biases. Uh, for instance, a misunderstanding of, of the, the concept of conservatism in science. Scientists like to be conservative. They don't want to make unfounded claims of fact. But sometimes they misapply this. And, and there's no better example of this than in the case of species that may be occurring naturally or may be occurring as escapes from captivity. What do you do with a barnacle goose that you, that you see? You don't know whether it got away from somebody or whether, it, um, or whether it actually came from Greenland as a natural vagrant. I would argue that it's an abuse of the principle of conservatism to exclude it from the major texts that describe biodiversity, just even, even though you strongly suspect that some of them are natural vagrants, but to completely exclude them on the basis that you're not 100% certain about each individual one is actually a radical idea. And when these things show up, people do notice them. It's not as though they're, they're overlooked. And the bird watchers notice them. This is uh, Pat Lindsay's year list sheet from uh, the past decade, and you see barnacle goose written in because it wasn't, nobody was, the records committee was not accepting them. The wildlife biologist said, though, they're not part of our avifauna. Um, the first couple of them have parentheses around them. Why is that? Because you can't count them, quote, quote unquote, um, because they're not vetted by the, by the authorities. But nevertheless, fortunately, the, there is a record of the occurrences of these birds. And when we compare that to the record of demographic increase of the Bre Greenland breeding population, it's unequivocal. These birds are occurring as natural migrants. They now occur every year in multiples on Long Island. There's one in Inwood Hill Park in Manhattan right now. Um, and they've now become absolutely expected. And, and the amateur birders know this is not even a, a bird of, of, uh, of great interest anymore. Yet whether it's shown up on the horizon of wildlife biologists, I don't know. That's, uh, that's another, uh, another question. But that's what I mean by systematic gaps in, in our knowledge of, of distribution for different reasons, identification problems, for um, conceptual problems. Moving on to spring. 
really a time when we often think of migration really as, as the, this such a, a pleasurable thing to, to behold. There's a scarlet tanager just back from, from the tropics. For many, many years, people have known that if you go out to the outer beach under the right kinds of weather conditions, that you don't just find these birds around the flowering trees in the middle of May, but you find them sitting on the grass at the end of April. These are scarlet tanagers, rose-breasted grosbeaks, indigo buntings, and, and some of their, their relatives. These are birds that got interrupted in their normal migration across the Gulf of Mexico and picked up in a weather slingshot and flung up onto our, our beaches. This has been going on as long as people have been out here. There are records of this going back to the 1800s. But what nobody knew during those, those early instances of this, or even until it finally was forced upon our attention was that some of these species, like blue grosbeak, are not just novelties. They've actually now colonized Long Island as breeders. They were showing up on our beaches for decades, if not centuries or millennia, um, and not breeding here. But as the environment has changed on Long Island to become suitable to them, they have now taken advantage of the fact that as highly mobile organisms, they do encounter all kinds of different places. Now they find that they can breed in the pine barrens of Long Island, and they're doing so increasingly. Same thing with summer tanager. The first breeding record was here on Brookhaven property, and they've, uh, they've been present, I think, um, most years as breeders since then. Prothonotary warbler, another southeastern United States breeding species that's expanding its breeding range northward. And the discoveries of these new breeders have been driven by, by uh, citizen scientists li largely. So moving to summer, I mentioned osprey. Its success story is a, 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 a beautiful one, a wonderful one. It's a quintessential Long Island breeder. Another quintessential Long Island bird is the common tern. These are birds that make vast globe trekking migrations, but they do breed with us. A couple of very familiar species of conservation concern, least terns and, and piping plovers. Less familiar to most, but beautiful and, and globally rare, or roseate tern. These are the breeding summer birds. They're, they're basically doing their thing here during the summer. But what we found by going out and paying close attention to specific areas along the coast is that there are other species that are occurring that are neither breeding species. This is an Arctic tern. They don't breed here. They don't winter here. They winter in the Antarctic. They breed in the Arctic. Um, but yet they occur here regularly during the summer. Immature birds. What are they doing here? I don't know exactly what they're, what they're doing here, but they are here. They're part of our avifauna. They're part of our ecological communities. They connect our ecosystems with ecosystems around the entire planet. Um, and yet, they were essentially unknown, known by three specimens for over, over a century of ornithological work on Long Island, until focused efforts and improved identification revealed that they were, in fact, much more regular. And you can see these four Arctic terns all look different from each other, and they look like varying plumages of, of common terns, but that's, this is what you see if you go out there and study them. So this is all of time prior to 1969, how many Arctic terns were no known from all of New York State. The jump from 79 to 88 is due to one person who figured out how to identify him and where to look for him, Paul Buckley. He, he moved up to New England and uh, things went back to normal. And then some of his protégés, like Steve and others, uh, took over the, uh, the, the reins here. And we went out. And, and, and by following Paul's model, we, we found them. And uh, really a, a, a very interesting example of how a species is there and, and yet unknown, um, unless you know how to look for it. And this is a theme in general of, of, uh, of studying bird movements. You have to be receptive to the unexpected. This is a sooty tern that was sitting along the Ocean Parkway uh, on August 28, 2011, during uh, the height of uh, Hurricane Irene. Um, during that hurricane, due to the marvels of uh, modern meteorology, we knew that we could actually be out there on the Ocean Parkway and not drown um, during that one. Seriously, uh, you have to pay close attention to, to things like that. But it was a remarkable storm, and it brought 
an unprecedented number of tropical terns and Gulf Stream species of pelagic birds by virtue of this perfect track and perfect intensity. It was intense enough to entrain birds and yet not intense enough to be a dangerous storm. We know, of course, that uh, Sandy was uh, far more dangerous than that. And the memory of that, recent memory of that, leads me just to another conservation uh, question. This is a salt marsh sparrow. Salt marsh sparrows are an endangered species, in my opinion. And the reason is not that we find that their breeding reproductive success in this marsh is low or in that marsh is high, but this one is bad or that, or predators or this. The reason that they're endangered is sea level rise. And they live in our salt marshes, and as sea level rises, unless we plan ahead, not by doing painstaking studies of what salt marsh sparrows are doing right now in this marsh here or that marsh there, but by planning where are the salt marshes going to go when the sea level rises. That's the only question. To save an entire ecological community and all of its species, it doesn't require detailed inventory knowledge. It needs a topographic map and then political willpower to, to protect some upland areas for salt marshes to migrate up onto from the adjacent estuaries. But in most cases, the habitat changes that affect bird abundance are much more subtle. And so for instance, for many, many forest breeding birds on Long Island, Peter Alden mentioned that you know, forest breeding birds in New England or in the broader you know, taiga belt of North America are doing great. But on Long Island, our forest breeding birds are not doing well. Our forests are fragmented and small and of perilously marginal quality for many species. And detecting when a particular population of forest breeding migrant birds dips below sustainability is very difficult to do. And this is why I say that avian distributional data are very, very difficult to interpret. If you look at a marble salamander distribution map, you can see marble salamanders are absent from the urban areas around Providence, Rhode Island, but they're found in the um, undeveloped areas out there. And when you see a blue dot there, you know they don't occur in populations of one. They, there's a breeding, sustaining population that's been there for a long time since the Pleistocene. And will stay there if you protect the, the habitat as well. But when you look at a whippoorwill map on Long Island, you see all these blue squares. This is the change map. The blue squares are squares where it was present as a breeder in 1980, but is absent in, in 2000. The gray areas, like where we are right now, are areas where they were present in 1980, are still present now. But this can be very, very misleading. I would argue that whippoorwills are virtually extirpated as a functionally breeding population on Long Island. There are places where they still come. Why is it, though, that they're here? I mean, you can go out and find them. But if you actually did go to the incredibly difficult lengths of measuring their reproductive success, you would probably find that their populations are not replacing themselves here. The habitat is attractive enough to attract dispersing individuals to give it a try, but Long Island has probably become or is becoming a sink for these species. And yet, it's very difficult to actually prove that or to come up with a, uh, a management plan that would actually um, address this issue. Another systematic uh, difficulty in understanding why certain species are where they are when they are. So here's a, a northern cardinal, a bird we utterly take for granted, but which was absent here in the lifetime of many people in this, this room. So this is a conservation success story, but it's a success story where the conservation planners laid out a welcome map for, for uh, northern cardinals. What we did to the landscape, suburbanization of Long Island and so on and so forth, was perfect for this bird. That's not why we did it, right? Nobody did what they did in the 1930s and 40s and 50s in order to attract northern cardinals to come here. But yet, this is now an absolutely abundant, widespread characteristic bird of our, of our area. Bird distributions change. and. Conservation planning has to acknowledge that. It cannot take a static view that we're going to protect and preserve the given composition of species that are present at this moment and freeze that into, and project it into the future. The future is going to have different species, for better or worse, and probably both. 
This is, uh, these are data from the uh, Christmas bird count showing the center of gravity of north-south distribution of, um, of, of North American birds as measured by huge amounts of citizen science over, over half a century. And the trend of northward um, uh, uh, movement of the center of geographic distribution is unmistakable. And we see it over and over again. Carolina wrens were rare to absent in, uh, in our area a century ago, and yet now they are one of the most abundant birds in some habitats. Not by virtue of anybody having anticipated it or planned for it. So these are, are three Rhode Island Christmas bird counts, but they could just as easily be Eastern Long Island Christmas bird counts, showing exponential trajectories of uh, Carolina wrens in my lifetime. So the question I, 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 I come up with here is, did we know enough to explain why we have the birds that we do have here? We, don't, we didn't. I think that's, that's clear. Nobody projected um, in the 1940s that these were going to be Long Island birds, classic Long Island birds then. I chose these particular examples of species where my own avocational uh, bird watching behavior has been played a major role in actually demonstrating their uh, regular occurrence around here. There are many others actually that I could uh, point out as well that were flying under the radar until people um, detected them and uh, proved their existence even even recently. And the the one of the lessons I draw from this is that. Vagrancy is biologically important, and yet it's almost, it's very difficult to study academically. I can tell you that from uh, the history of my grant proposals, but um, <laughs> it is biologically interesting. It yields insights into the connection between dispersal, migration, and range distribution change in, in birds. And everything that we know about vagrants, almost everything that we know about vagrants comes from amateur naturalists, not from, from dedicated um, um, traditional biological research. So I'll go back to my original um, point, and I, and, I, and I don't mean this in any kind of, in a flippant way, because those truisms that I mentioned before are certainly true. It is very, very worthwhile to have detailed inventory data to understand what we have and what it's doing and, and how we should plan for it. But we can turn that statement around. Not only do we need detailed biodiversity inventory data in order to plan for conservation, it is absolutely obviously clear that we need conservation as a prerequisite for whatever biodiversity we might want to know about in the future. So the, the, the point here is that species turnover rates are very surprisingly high. And the, if you look at a, a breeding bird survey conducted this year and compare it to one conducted in 1970 to one in 1940, the typical, common, um, absolutely classic resident species have changed over time and not in a way that was anticipated, planned for, or desired for any particular reason by the, the people who were on watch during the times when these things happened. Lack of biological inventory data should not be used as, a, as an excuse not to protect a given, a, a given area when you have external sources of evidence that show it's what its ecological value would be. Conservationists almost never regret protecting a site. They'll say, oh, we protected the old Grumman property. Um, it turns out that uh, you know, we, we didn't need to in order to, to, uh, to keep um, American kestrels present as breeders on Long Island. But you know what? By protecting it, you will have a whole suite of species in 50 years that will be using that intact functioning ecosystem that would not be there had the, the, the place been destroyed. And that really um, uh, leaves me with my finishing point here, which is the best sites over time, naturalists know where they are. And they don't change that much over time as long as they're not destroyed. They do change, what changes in these sites? The species composition, the actual identities of the species that are present there. And yet, if they are protected and maintain ecosystem function and integrity, some species will blip out, 
some species will, will move in, and yet those communities will still retain ecological value um, into the future. So, um, you know, we think about this as we think about um, species that we take for granted today that are at the southern ends of their breeding ranges. It's not just birds that are moving up out of the south. What are, can anybody think of a bird that is near the, the, where Long Island is about the warmest place in its global range? Classic bird I like to think of is black-capped chickadee, okay? Um, if you project what the temperature of Long Island is going to be in 50 years or 100 years, it is warmer than any place where black-capped chickadees live right now. So they probably are not going to persist on, on Long Island far into the future. Now, that, to, for, to tell a wildlife manager that you have to worry about black-capped chickadee as an endangered species, that they, they would laugh at you if you said that, because it's one of our commonest, most ecologically tolerant species. They're found in all different habitats. And yet, there it is. It's uh, very, very likely that um, in the future, that bird will drift off. And what should replace it by virtue of looking at the climate maps and this Carolina chickadees? But they might be blocked by an urban barrier, so we might wind up with no chickadees. But this is just an example of thinking outside of the, the uh, microanalysis of demography and, and population trends in, in individual species and looking at the bigger picture of how groups of species interact and uh, occur in our, uh, in our corner of the world. So this is a, uh, our national symbol, a bald eagle that was uh, hanging out out at uh, Democrat Point feeding on bait fish uh, handouts from the fishermen for a while. Turned out that this bird had been shot um, but was brought into, uh, um, in, into rehab and, and, uh, and did survive. But it's a, a, a little uh, vignette that I'll, I'll close with as a, a symbol of our, uh, of our biodiversity and all of its surprising and unexpected dimensions. But thank you. It's a great illustration of the unintended consequences, unanticipated uh, consequences. And it, you know, it reminds me of another uh, closely related species to the whippoorwill is the chuckwill's widow. This is a bird that is a conservation enigma because its, glo its global breeding range is expanding northward as climate changes or for various reasons. So it's got a, a positive trend at the northern end of its range. And yet I would say that if you studied details of the demography of individual populations, that their prospects are, are diminishing into the future for the same reasons that whippoorwills are facing increasing challenges in the future. So what do we think of for our, our truckwills widows on Long Island and southern New England? Are they an increasing species that will continue to increase into the future? Will they get a toehold and then fall back? We don't know what, what the answers to, to those things are, but it's not as simple as, uh, a, as just a, um, a single um, dimension to the trajectory of, a, of even um, one well-studied species. Thank you. 
Well, that, that, that's a, a, huge, uh, a huge question and obviously one with uh, a lot of non-biological uh, aspects to it, but um, the sea level is rising and uh, the ocean pushes the dune from here to, to here. The, my first feeling would be to let the dune be where it wants to be, um, if at all possible. Now, obviously, it's not always going to be possible to do that. But uh, you, you, know, you raise a great point when you talk about the barrier beaches, the rockaways, and, and, and uh, out further from that. People can talk about investing billions in, in, in building protective barriers for some area, like they built one in Providence, Rhode Island after the 1938 hurricane that killed many people there. That was a very expensive project up at the top of Narragansett Bay. Um, you could do that at, at lower New York Bay, I, I suppose. It would be vastly bigger and more expensive, but you cannot build a barrier to protect the barrier beach. There's no, you cannot uh, um, uh, protect the Rockaways, Jones Strip, Fire Island, and, and so on. That is what you've got. That's, that's where, where the, uh, the, the sediments uh, want, to, uh, want to reside. And building on, on barrier beaches, obviously, is, uh, is a perilous thing to do. Absolutely. We do. We do, and um, it, it's an, another example. I almost put this example into the talk, but I didn't want to make it um, uh, too long. Um, the species that, are, that we all know are, are, have been proven to be vulnerable are often in the corvid family, the crow family. American crows are extremely susceptible. They have a very high lethality rate when they are infected with West Nile virus. American crows used to occur in several different winter roosts on Long Island on the order of tens of thousands of birds, 10 to 20,000 birds in Brooklyn and Western Suffolk County and, and Eastern Suffolk County. They're, and I don't know the locations of all of them, but they're actually documented, um, the, the locations of these. Nobody has seen a winter roost of American crows in excess of 10,000 since the, the, the real first wave of, of, of West Nile virus. That species has under, has experienced a population decrease of probably two or three orders of magnitude on, on Long Island since then. Still a common bird. It's not a bird of conservation concern, quote unquote, and, and so on and so forth. But there are ecological consequences to this. American crows now share Long Island with two other species in their genus, one of which is the fish crow, which is known from lab studies to be less um, vulnerable to the lethal effects of West Nile virus. Like instead of 99% of them dying when they're infected, some, I don't, I'm not sure of the exact numbers, but something like 50% of them survive an infection with West Nile virus. And their populations have demonstrably increased over the exact time period when the American crow populations um, went into the tank. But then there's the mystery of the third corvid species, which I know some of the folks from uh, from Queens and and uh, the yeah the the, uh, the the common raven, which when I was a kid was considered to be a wilderness specialist. This was a bird that you could try to hope to see if you went up to the White Mountains of, of New Hampshire or up into the Adirondack wilderness uh, and was thought to be just intolerant of people. It turns out that what they were intolerant of was being shot and um, <laughs> th th that once that happened less often than it used to happen, they increased in, around those, those um, little uh, refugia in which they, they had retreated to. But it now turns out that possibly another reason that they didn't occupy the coastal lowlands was the incredibly high population density of American crows. Because since the decimation of the American crow, they have invaded the coastal lowlands. And, and they now are breeding on Long Island in, uh, in several uh, places. And other birds that share the same ecological guild with these birds, turkey vulture and bald eagle, uh, for instance, have also increased markedly over that very same, uh, and black vulture, have moved into the coastal lowlands where they were previously um, largely absent over that same time period. 
These are descriptive correlations. We don't know that it's the, caused by the removal of the, the American crows, but the raw data to test that hypothesis, again, were collected by citizen uh, scientists and, and, and bird watchers. So that's a, a, a great uh, um, example of how uh, just an accidental thing, this introduction of a, of a foreign pathogen, can have cascading consequences for multiple vertebrate species, for instance. <laughs> experiment with hives, which are going to cite the uh, you know, cataclysmic event that uh, decimated their population years ago. When the cataclysmic event made two thirds of the population. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, that, that, uh, that very theme actually does t tie in here. One of the, the birds I didn't really have time to talk about in, um, in detail was the, uh, the little cackling goose I showed up on the, on the screen at one point. Steve's referring to the, the, that the old sharp-tailed sparrow was split into two species that, that uh, come together in southern Maine in the marshes there. North of there, they're Nelson sparrows. South of there, they're, they're salt marsh sparrows. And that's a... Uh, you know, a technical taxonomic decision that affects, you know, the, the various uh, um, bio population parameters of, uh, of these birds. But a similar one was the splitting of the cackling goose from the can familiar Canada goose. And the fact that we barely knew that cackling geese occurred on Long Island, in New York State, in the Northeast at all prior to that split is another example of systematic gaps in our biodiversity inventory knowledge. As soon as it became quote unquote countable for the bird watchers, um, whenever that was in the early, uh, early 2000s, birders figured out how to identify them, went out, documented them, found them commonly, regularly around us. And we'll never know really whether to what extent the current prevalence of cackling geese in our region is a biological trend from former scarcity to, to present abundance or a detection error that when they were classified as a subspecies, they were neglected by everybody it, just for purely arbitrary taxonomic reasons. Okay. Thank you very much.